Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Anything that moves, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. Go. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Fran Duffy. That's right, another week, and we are talking tight ends today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 179. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with former Pro Bowl tight end Chris Cooley about the importance of the tight end position in today's NFL and the importance and the effectiveness of a good 12 and 13 personnel package, something that I'm very passionate about, something that Chris is obviously very passionate about as well, and something that he sees down in Washington and certainly here in Philadelphia with Zach Gertz and Dallas Goddard both in the fold. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get into my chat now with Chris Cooley and Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, really excited to welcome in a two-time Pro Bowl tight end and Chris Cooley. Chris, uh, welcome to the show. Really excited to have you on to, to talk about some tight ends here today. Friend, it's it's my pleasure, man. And I gotta say, you're doing such a good job with everything. Um, I was excited when you when you sent me a message. I appreciate it, man. It's uh, obviously a lot of fun digging into the X's and O's and just how teams uh, try to attack other teams, how teams build their rosters, and just overall team building is, just, is something I've been fascinated with uh, for most of my uh, for most of my life, going back to when I was in middle school. So uh, really excited just to talk about just the matchup problems that tight ends can create in today's NFL. And obviously, look, you're very close to a Washington Redskins team. Jay Gruden has been doing it at a high level with Vernon Davis and Jordan Reed down there in Washington for since he's been there, you go back to you know to what uh, the Shanahan's have done as well down there in Washington. They've always relied on the tight end position, and then also here in Philadelphia now with with Zach Gertz and Dallas Goddard in the fold. The way that the Eagles were able to attack offense or attack defenses last year with twelve and thirteen personnel really kind of brings to the forefront what a tight end can do for an offense. Real quickly before we kind of dive into it, your thoughts on Zach Gertz and Dallas Goddard, what those two guys looked like last year as you watched from afar. Well, I personally think that, that Zach is, if not the best tight end in the league, right in the same spot as, as Travis Kelsey with being able to do everything. I am I am a huge fan of what, what Zach's been able to do and accomplish. It, it, he is He's a pro. He runs routes. You never can tell what he's doing. His speed change is awesome. Everything looks the same. It's just he's 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 a great friend. And then Dallas Goddard was a major acquisition. I, I thought Dallas Goddard should have been first rounder a year ago. He's another that can play Y or H or whatever you want to call it, Y or F. So he's a versatile guy as well. And he's also he's a sneaky good route runner. And he had a ton of production in college, be it at an FCS school. I think South Dakota State was where he was at. But, you know, he's a guy that does everything. So the Eagles are probably the best duo of tight ends in the league. Well, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the, the route running aspect with both those guys. You know, Zach, I, I know I remember talking with uh, John Filippo, who at the time was the Eagles quarterbacks coach a couple years ago. And John had called him the, the best tight, the best route running tight end in the NFL, one of the best route runners of tight end he had ever coached. And then Dallas Goddard, you know, the, the one route that you feel, I feel like you could really see it with him and how he had kind of evolved over the course of his rookie season. So with the with the stick nod, you know, I remember watching him run it in uh, in training camp, and you know he's a little bit fast through the through the double move. He didn't quite sell the stick before uh, breaking towards the post, and then he runs it in the uh, in the playoff game against Chicago. He was wide open for a touchdown. You kind of see that he had just kind of tempered it a little bit, was a little bit more deliberate with selling that stick move. How, how talk about the route running aspect of the position and just how important that is for those guys because they're not receivers that run four three and can just run away from guys. You have to have that technical aspect as well. Well, the thing that I think is, is the most exciting about the Eagles tight ends is their ability to attack leverage to create their own leverage. And Zach is Zach is the best I've seen at it. If you want to show a young tight end how to understand defense and understand leverage. He he is amazing. Um, I, I I can think individually to a, a route he ran against the Giants. I think last year in Philly against Landon Collins, where he comes across the formation, 
from right to left, and, and Landon follows him. And, and so it looks like man-to-man, but you see Sacker is looking back into the middle of the field. He knows Landon's over the top, but he's looking to see if the backers have bumped. And then he hard arc releases outside to slip Landon inside. And it was just awesome, man. I mean, it was it was so perfect how he attacked the leverage. He understood that Landon had the flat, so he pushed him really hard to the flat to get back inside. And you see him do it over and over again. You see, that's why he's so open in, in zone concepts and holes in the middle of the field. He knows where the holes are going to be. He has anticipation and timing and to get into those holes. And then what what makes him really special is when it is man-to-man, he scares guys to death. It, 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 with the Earths, it, and I know with the Redskins, it was like, is it going to be a corner? Is it going to be a seventh stop or a corner stop? Is he going to run a takeoff off of that? That's probably where Goddard got so good at this stick knot is all of Earths' double move stuff. He's learning from him. But it, he he looks like he's doing the same thing every time. The speed is the same. His arm swing, his body language is the same. And it doesn't matter if it's 5, if it's 10, 20. But it looks like he's doing the same thing. So he never gives defenders any kind of tell. He is really, really special. I mean, it's not like he's going to cross guys up like Kelsey can do or like Jordan Reed has done in the past with, with a big double stick type of move or a big one too. But he he loses dudes. And and it's because of how fluid he is. Talk about that from from going back to your career, you know, because you, you were one of those guys that uh, you know was just so versatile and could do so many different things for an offense. When did it click for you as a route runner? Obviously, you you felt good about it coming from college to the NFL. Was there a kind of a moment in, once you got to the league where you know what I I know I've got to get better in this area? And what was that transition like for you? The transition was. Not as much as I thought it was going to be in, in terms of just simply route running. The, defensively, it's there, it's a little bit more complex, but for the tight end, it, you're really just looking at is there a single high and do you have cover three or man, or is there two high and is it quarters or two? The quarterback has a lot more going on, especially on an NFL level, but for young receivers and tight ends, if you want to understand the most simple aspects, it wasn't too tough. And so I, I wasn't the fastest guy, so I found a way to – attack zones and attack leverage. And I found a way to create a little bit of space as, as far as a man-to-man route runner. I think I could have gotten a lot better as a route runner as my career progressed. In my last couple of years, I, I worked with Sean McVay, and I was just wowed at how good he was as, as a young coach in teaching me. And I was five years older than him at the time, teaching me new ways to run routes and, and how to be precise and and exactly how to place your foot in certain cuts and sticks and all the things you do at the, just the top of the stem. Um, for me, most of mine through my early part of my career was, was innate, and it worked. I think I, think I could have been much better. And, that, and then you watch guys like Ertz and, and Kelsey and some of those really good route runners, and, and I know it could have improved for me. Before we get into it from a, a pure like X and O standpoint, let's just talk about the tight end position in general. When you have a guy like that, that is, you know, that has the ability to win in so many different ways, both as a blocker and as a receiver. Just that one individual, what can that guy do for an offense? What does that mean to a play caller and to a head coach? Well, you can see that is kind of the desired position in football right now. As you went through this draft, T.J. Hawkinson's not the eighth pick in the draft because of his ability to run routes or his ability to block. It's the combination of both of those and what that means for an offense. They can stay balanced. You don't have to create tendencies by playing a blocking tight end and and then having a versatile route running tight end who who can't block as well. And I think that's one of the things that have really hurt the Redskins over the last couple of years is they have too many tendencies with, with Jordan not being a blocker with Vernon not being as much of a blocker, and then with a guy like Jeremy Sprinkle coming in and blocking about 90% of the time that he's in. Yeah. It's also on the flip side, I think, what makes the Eagles really tough to defend is you don't know if Ertz is the why or if Goddard's the why or if they're going to flip him. You can't necessarily tell the strength of the offense with those two tight ends in the game. So you love that as a play caller because you're not concerned about running and getting to the edge to the tight end side. You're not, a, you're not concerned about them on the back side of things. And then you know when you start to create play-action looks that you're going to get the looks that you want because you can dictate where your strengths are. 
and what really gives me a lot of juice for it and gets me really excited about what this team can be. We saw it in flashes last year with what they started to do with tempo, and you come out in one look and you say, okay, uh, we're going to line up with both guys with their hands in the dirt, and you're, we're going to run the football. You go tempo, you go hurry up. Now we're going to spread everybody out. We're going to go empty, and when you've got those two guys that can do those things, that can be used in all those different ways, it really can start with mess with mess de- start to mess with defenses in that way. Yeah, and it can really start to benefit offenses in a big way because m- most defenses will stay in base at, to a, a two tight end set, and it, it depends on who the two tight ends are. For example, if I were playing the Redskins defensively, I, w- I would go nickel to our two tight ends. But if I'm playing the Philadelphia Eagles, I have to stay in base because of their ability to block and run the ball on a two tight end set. And so, when you have a base defense with two tight ends, so essentially you have three backers or a three four front four backers. And then you start to widen them out. You widen one guy out, and they can bump it and hide in disguise coverage. Like, hey, maybe we're going to play a man, but we bumped one guy for this one look. And, and we'll, we'll trick you with a couple zones to that. You bump the other guy out, and they're going to tell you immediately. So, one, it's a tell for the coach. It makes it easy for any kind of check with me stuff. It makes it really easy in the RPO game. And it makes it very simple for the quarterback and the rest of the receivers to understand this is the look we're going to get. I like pre-snap, I know what we're going to get. I think it also, when you start moving them around, makes it really hard for blitzes or for defenses to blitz, and they have to check things and they check out of, of what, what they want to do in their base conceptually. So it is, it is a big-time advantage to have those two guys be able to do that. And, and it doesn't matter, in my opinion, if it's another back. Like if you have a fullback that can do some of those things, it's the same. It's the same ideal. And really, even in third down situations, if you have a, your third down back who can move, you need two guys who can move all over the field to really dictate defense. Yeah, and what I love about that, you know, you come out in one look, and then you even if you motion out, so many defenses now. Like if you if you're in your base package you only have one coverage that you're going to check to to empty. And so now you're making yourself uh, predictable from an offensive standpoint. You say, all right, if I know their empty check uh, from a coverage standpoint is going to go, they're going to go cover two. I've got all my cover two beaters in the back of my bag. And I say, all right, well, as soon as we check out, we move out to empty, we're going to run those cover two beaters. We're able to attack, take advantage of some of those matchups in space. And, and that's the stuff that uh, I think you know the best offensive coordinators are so, so good at. And we saw that a lot uh, from the Eagles last year. Let me ask you this question. We're starting to see a lot more in terms of sub package in the NFL. That's uh, that's no secret. But I think one of the things we're starting to see more of too is kind of the variance in that sub package. It's not just, oh, we're gonna put our slot corner out there and we're gonna go nickel. Now you're starting to see more of the you know the the big nickel, you know, with three safeties on the field with the ability to match up to these kind of personnel packages. Do you kind of see that the league is gonna be going more that way to try and match up with some of these twelve and thirteen personnel sets? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised in any way to perform. I think I think college teams are getting smaller as well, mm. in general. And, mm. and and the thing is, is if you have tight ends who can maul a safety, then you can't do it. If, if you can't hold the edge as a safety, it, it makes it really, really tough. And so if I have two tight ends who, who block effectively, and I know I'm going to get that big nickel package, I'm going to line up in an even set on either side with two tight ends, like one tight end on one, one tight end on the other. Now I'm going to check with me at the safety, mm. at the at the the backer who's a safety. Like I'm going to go with check with me stuff all day long, and I'm going to attack him. But the the thing is, is you don't have that many t- tight ends in the league that block well. It's that's that's one of the biggest changes in the position. Is college has spread these guys out so much that they they aren't effective blockers in, in tight and in a phone booth. Even getting to safety, that they so spread out guys. Yeah, I mean, I remember, I remember hearing from uh, from Jim Schwartz. I want to say it was two summers ago. Uh, you know, he was asked. I forget even who he was asked about. It was about a tight end uh, on another team, and you know the, about his versatility. And he kind of went off on a tangent. He said, "Look, you know, ver- versatility at a tight end position doesn't mean that you know you can line up wherever you know, line up out wide or line up in the slot. Versatility means that you can both be a, a threat as a pass catcher and a threat as a blocker. And it just goes to what we were talking about earlier. You're keeping defenses honest in terms of you don't know what the offense is going to do when you're on the field. Let me let me ask you this question: When you played, would you have rathered? face a, a linebacker who was more adept at coverage or a safety who was kind of a bigger guy, more physical, and he's more used to playing in space, but he's got the size and the physicality. Who would you have rather matched up with uh, on a week-to-week basis? To me, as long as it wasn't a, a corner, 
I was in pretty good shape as a route runner. But it, I see, I hadn't developed to that truly spread out package. Like, I was part of one of the initial offenses that, that really started utilizing what the H-back was. That was when Joe Gibbs came back into the NFL, and we ran an 80s offense, and people hadn't run that spread H-back movement offense. And when, then when I started moving out wide in the slot, I wasn't accustomed to and as adept to getting off the of press and getting off the of corners and the way they their quickness after their second step. So for safeties and, and linebackers, I could create a, a leverage or I could create an angle on them. But corners, I, I couldn't. I wasn't fast enough. I couldn't move that way. As long as it wasn't a, a true DB, that's where I was in pretty good shape. Are there parts of the tight end position, Chris, that you feel that you know we in the media, just being on the outside, um, that we talk about too much that maybe are, isn't as important? Or, or conversely, is there something that we don't talk about enough that is really, really important to the position? I still think it's very overlooked who is and who is not a good blocker. Yeah. Like I hear, I hear compliments and praise given to guys because they're big that are not good blocking tight ends. I, I think that's, that's hysterical. We still don't know who really blocks effectively. Like, yeah, as, a, as a fan base in general in the NFL, the best you're going to say are the very best. That, that's not debatable. But, yeah, I, I, like, this is a for example. I'm not saying Rob Gronkowski wasn't a good blocker. He, he's a good blocker. He's not the best blocking tight end in the NFL. There are guys that are better than Gronk. Yeah. But, I mean, put him together with what he can do. He's, he's one of the best players in the NFL. But, you know, we just we get great big guys, and we say they're good blockers. And we don't know. What's the most important athletic trait for a tight end in your mind? Such a great question. Um... It depends on what the tight end is. It depends on who he is, and then it depends on the way the coaching staff is going to use it. Like for me, I think my best athletic trait was balance, and it helped me in the run game, and it helped me in, in terms of yards after the catch. I broke a lot of tackles. I wasn't a physical run-through-you kind of guy. I just had great balance. I was a wrestler. But then you look at guys like Tony Gonzalez and Antonio Gates and, and Jordan Reed, and you say body control, I mean, which, which I guess is a little bit of balance. Or you say speed, or you say quick twitch stuff. Um, it, it, it's amazing. It just depends on the kind of guy. You know, you could say power for certain type, types of player. But I, I like the guys. Like the guys that I feel like are the best tight ends are the guys that I know could play another sport that are really athletic, not run fast athletic. You know what I mean? Not not jump high, just combine stuff. The guys that could beat you in a one-on-one game of basketball or could beat anybody on their team. The guys that wrestled. The guys that, that were baseball players. I love baseball players because they address situationally where everything is and they know down and distance and they get to the first down six. They get out of bounds when they get up when they need to get out of bounds. The guys that were true athletes, I think, are, are the best tight ends because of the versatility of that position and, and the idea that that guy is going to essentially play every position on the field not necessarily in-line blocking as a lineman, but they're going to play on the line and split out. They have to be able to do everything if you want to be a good tight end, which makes it just that overall athletic build perfect. Well, last thing for you, Chris, where can uh, our listeners find you? What, tell us about some of the work that you're doing uh, down there in Washington and where they can hear more of your work. Yeah, friend, I do a podcast for the Redskins. It's on iTunes. I think you Google Chris Cooley on iTunes and, and you can listen to that podcast. Uh, and then I do our, our game day broadcast. I call our games once uh, once the season starts on Redskins Radio. So that's what that's what I've been doing over the last few years. And like you, it's, it's fun to be around football, man. That's it, man. Well, I really appreciate the time here uh, on Chalk Talk on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. Uh, we'll hope to talk to you soon, man. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me. Well, just great stuff there from Chris Cooley about the tight end position and just great insight into playing the position here uh, in the NFL at a high level. Well, obviously, one of the best to do it during his career down in Washington. And if you want some more insight into playing the game, and if you have a young Eagles fan in your life that is really excited to learn more, I implore you, go check out the Eagles Football Academy. The Eagles Football Academy offers hands-on coaching and instruction for football players between the ages of 7 and 16. They're one-day clinics. They're held right here in 
South Philly at the Novacare Complex, and they feature non-contact drills led by some of the top high school and college coaches in the area. The Eagles players will be there. Swoop is there. Cheerleaders are there. These summer clinics are feeling really fast. So visit PhiladelphiaEagles.com slash Eagles Academy to sign up your son, your daughter, your young Eagles fan in your life today. I promise you will not regret it. It's something that I've had some of my family members go and do, and they had a blast doing it. So go check out the Eagles Football Academy again. Very early now in June, you want to make sure you get in there, get in there and sign up for the Eagles Football Academy. All right, great stuff again from Chris Cooley, and you can follow him just like I do on Twitter at the Cooley Zone. And while you're at it, I'm at fduffy3. That's where you can find all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce here at PhiladelphiaEagles.com. And you know how much I appreciate you guys supporting the podcast on any form of social media. That is one way to support the show, but the other is going to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Give us a rating or even leave us a comment. I wanted to give a shout out today to Eagles Troll the World who left a comment and a rating on our Apple podcast page saying the following question. I think this offensive roster is more set up to be a viable, dynamic, and multiple with the 11, 12, and 13 personnel sets. Can you touch on that as it compares to Doug Peterson's rosters in his tenure here? Assuming health, how do you forecast the percentage breakdown? It's a good question. It's very tough, though, because you know you can go into a certain game with a game plan saying, okay, hey, we're going to go in and say we're going to focus on our 12 personnel package in this game. We really like our matchups. Then you might have one injury, and all of a sudden – you got to get away from 12 personnel. You get away and you do more 11. Or maybe your receivers get hurt and now you got to go more 12 or 13. Like you said, you're, you're assuming health. I think ultimately when you look at it, last year the Eagles, I believe, were number one when it came to 12 and 13 personnel packages in terms of volume last year in the NFL. Do we expect that to climb? That would be my guess. I would assume that they're going to try and incorporate Dallas Goddard a little bit more. That remains to be seen. We'll see how it plays out. But I think ultimately when you look at this group, Doug Peterson has so many options. This offensive coaching staff has the ability to attack defenses in so many different ways. And really, that's the key. That's the biggest thing that we've seen now this offseason. You go and you get Deshaun Jackson. You go and you get J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. You go and get Miles Sanders and Jordan Howard at the running back position. Now you've got the ability to line up, not just in different personnel groupings, but in different versions of those personnel groupings. That You know, you have so many different combinations you can have with two or three wide receivers pairing those new wideouts with with Alshon Jeffrey, with Nelson Aguilar, with Matt Collins. You know, you have all these guys already in the fold, and now you bring those guys in. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how the Eagles try and attack off- or try and attack defenses this year with all the multiplicity they have on that side of the ball. It's going to be a lot of fun because Doug Peterson, obviously, one of the more creative offensive minds in the entire NFL. So great question there from Eagles Troll, and thank you to all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcast offerings at PhiladelphiaEagles.com. Right again, Thanks again so much to Chris Cooley. Great stuff from him this week. And all of you out there listening, thank you, whether you're on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and of of course on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and the Eagles mobile app. Thank you. And again, one last time, go rate the show. Leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Let us know what you think about the show. Give us a topic idea for the next few weeks to come as we get closer and closer to training camp. Until then, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novocare Complex. I'm Fran Duffy. We will see you next week.